the next topic to address as we look further into European imperialism is the European experience in India or India's experience with Europeans depending on how you want to phrase it. Um, one thing to remind us of as we begin is that we've talked about India before and the last time that we had talked about India uh, we were talking about the Mughal Empire. Um, we talked about Babur and Akbar and the creation of that Mughal Empire as far back as the 1500s and then had gone through Jahangir and Shah Jahan who built the Taj Mahal um, and then we had finished up with Aurangzeb and you may remember when we were learning about Aurangzeb that under his rule of the Mughal Empire the Mughal Empire gets the largest it ever was. Uh, you can see on this map here it includes not only almost all of what today is India uh, but even parts of what today would be uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, it's a huge sprawling empire but we had talked about the fact that as he is ruling uh, his empire is actually getting weaker. It's getting bigger and weaker at the same time which may sound odd but he was so focused on military conquest that he really lost control of sort of the day-to-day -day running and one of the biggest mistakes that he made, which nobody would have known at the time, uh, was he gave permission to the Europeans um, to kind of take possession of a trade city in India. I can't remember if it's Calicut or Bombay, but um, giving them permission to use that as a center for trade. Um, you know, the Europeans had been begging for almost a century to have access to Indian goods. Uh, Bartolomeu Diaz had tried to sail to India, Vasco da Gama was the first one to actually get there, and then after his success the Europeans spent about a hundred years trying to get a foothold in India uh, to gain access to all of India's considerable trade wealth. Uh, cotton and spices and all of those luxury items that Europeans had been wanting since the Renaissance. What's going to happen now you know, fast forward to the 1800s. The Europeans have now had this foothold in India ever since Aurangzeb gave them permission. But the challenge uh, and the transition that took place was India is really far from England um, and France and the Netherlands and Portugal and all of those countries had found a way to get to India and begin trading. And so what a lot of those countries ended up doing was creating what they called an East India Company. Um, the British East India Company will become the most famous. It's been popularized in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, and the goal was we need to be able to run our day-to-day -day operations without having to send a letter back home to England every time we have a question. Because if you think about it, that trip from England or France or the Netherlands or Portugal or whatever to get to India by boat was a month or two. And so you imagine, you know, if you've got a question, you need the, the king or the queen's permission, that's, let's call it two months in a boat to get the letter there. And then the king or queen has to, you know, deliberate and think about how do we want to do this, what are we going to do. They have to, you know, meet with advisors and form committees and do investigations, and then they have to send a response back. That's another two months. I mean, it could be six months between when you ask a question and when you get an answer. And that's just not sustainable. Um, you'll miss out on so many opportunities. And so these East India companies were created to kind of be a mini government in India um, to represent England or France or the Netherlands or Portugal or whatever. Uh, in this case we'll talk about England. But the idea was that they could kind of act on their own in most cases. They could make their own decisions with you know, the, the monarch's authority. And this ends up making the East India Company incredibly powerful. Um, you know, they're the ones that have their hands on all of these resources in India, and they're the ones that have their hands on all the money being used to buy these resources and ship them back home. So the money alone and the resources make them incredibly powerful. Now add to this the fact that they obviously need to keep all these resources and money safe. Well, what do you need to keep those things safe? Well, you need security. You need an army. And so what the British East India Company does is they hire local Indians as soldiers. Now that may sound a little weird. Why on earth would these Indians willingly, you know, fight for the British? That that seems dumb. Well, think about it this way: you've learned about India's caste system. Um, there's a lot of people at the bottom that don't have very much, and then if you look at the life of a soldier, you're given three meals a day. You're given clean clothing in the form of a uniform. 
Uh, you're given a bed in the barracks, so you've got a roof over your head and a place to sleep. And you get a paycheck. So it's actually easy to understand why so many Indian people would go and serve. And the word for them, the word for these Indian soldiers that are fighting for the British East India Company, is sepoy. So these sepoys are Indian people fighting on behalf of the East India Company. Um, and what we're going to find is that between that control of wealth and resources and now having basically their own army, the British East India Company is an incredibly powerful organization in India. And what's going to happen by the end of the story is that they're going to take over. Um, and when I say take over, I mean the entire country of India. But it's not without problems along the way. Uh, and the biggest hiccup being the Sepoy Rebellion. See, after a couple of decades of you know, British officers directing these Sepoy soldiers, um, there's some discontent. Some of the Sepoys aren't happy, and it has to do with religion. Um, what happens is there's a rumor that starts going around that the packages of bullets that are issued to the Sepoy soldiers um, you know, it's a tropical climate. You've got to coat these bullets in grease or, you know, something to keep them from corroding or rusting. Because you want to make sure that in the middle of a battle you can pull out more ammunition, throw it into your rifle, and not have to worry about whether or not it's going to be able to fire. So these bullets are packaged in grease. Well, the most common form of, you know, preservative grease that you could use would be animal fat. You know, if you grill up, you know, cook up some bacon in your kitchen, you get a lot of grease left in the pan, and that kind of grease will actually do a great job of keeping metal safe from corrosion. The problem for the sepoys is, where is this grease coming from? You know, you may remember India has two huge religious populations, the biggest one being Hindus and the second one being Muslims. So if this animal fat that's being used as grease comes from cows, who's going to be upset? the Hindus, you know, who consider cows to be sacred animals and they don't eat beef. And if instead they're using the fat from pigs, well, the Muslim religion dictates that you don't eat pork. And so in either case, the reason why this becomes an issue is that when the sepoys are sent into battle, if they're in a gunfight, um, you know, they need to reload their rifle, they have to rip out these packages of bullets, and you don't have time to lay your rifle down and delicately open up the package and extract the bullets and wipe them down with a cloth. And, like, no, people are shooting at you, and you're shooting at them. So what you do is you rip out the package of bullets, you bite the corner with your teeth, you tear it open, and you get the bullets out. You jam them in the gun, and you keep fighting. But that action of having to get that grease in your mouth, essentially, is you know, a forcible violation of their religious beliefs. And so these sepoys, when this rumor starts going around that that's what their bullets have been packaged in all this time, they're pissed. They're absolutely pissed. And they go to their officers and they're like, this is not okay. Like, you're, you're making us violate our religious beliefs if this is true. And unfortunately, the response from the East India Company was, deal with it. Um, either these rumors aren't true, or they are, and you just need to suck it up because we pay you, and you have to follow our orders. And so in response to that, whatever the response was from the East India Company, uh, the sepoys rebel. They you know, throw down their guns, they refuse to fight, they refuse to follow orders until this has been fixed because they demand that their culture and their religious faith be valued. Well, the British response to this sepoy rebellion, you can see here in the picture, uh, this is a sepoy soldier. You can see the robe and head covering that would be fairly traditional for a lot of people in India. And you can see the British officers that are standing nearby. And it may be a little bit tough to see in the picture, but this sepoy soldier has actually been strapped to the front of a cannon. Uh, you can see the barrel here and the back end that counterbalances it there. And then as you look down the line, you see that this scene is being repeated for several sepoy soldiers. This is the public statement that the East India Company makes to regain control of their army. And so when these cannons are fired, obviously, that sends a very powerful and very graphic message to the rest of the army that complaining and rebellion are not going to be tolerated. 
Now, what the British probably weren't expecting was that the entire country of India is up in arms after this mass execution, uh, and again, understandably so. Uh, and so people throughout the subcontinent of India begin rebelling against what they see as just incredibly unfair treatment from the British. And it's at this point that the East India Company, supported by the British government, decide that they're going to shift from an indirect method of control to a direct method. They are going to occupy India forcibly. And so they roll out the army. All of the East India Company soldiers supplemented by the British army. And the result of this will be the British Raj. Uh, the British takeover of India to the point where the British government is ruling the people of India. That they are the new government. And that's going to be the case, you can see on this map. Um, that's going to be the case all the way up until the end of World War II. That from this time of the Sepoy Rebellion, for you know not quite a century, the British will rule India directly. And that will last until after the Second World War, when a man that you've probably heard of, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, is part of a massive movement by the people of India to get the British to leave so that the Indian people can once again rule their own country. So as we've talked about before, a lot of what you're learning in this chapter has had very far-reaching effects on countries today, whether it's Africa or India, um, obviously all the countries in Africa or the country of India itself. Um, and so as we look at the effects of imperialism on India, you're going to see a lot of the same things that we saw in Africa. Um, you know, one of the positives India gets British technology, just like many countries in Africa did. Railroads, factories, the telegraph, medicine, things like that. Um, and so along with a lot of those positive things, you know, there, there's going to be some side effects. And so one of the side effects of getting British technology, especially in the form of factories and steam engines, is that Indian manufacturers who for centuries had been producing the kinds of goods that people back in Europe were coveting, now they just can't keep up. You, you just can't make handmade goods nearly as fast as a factory can crank them out. And so these Indian textile workers uh, who were making beautiful garments, um, they just can't compete. And so they gradually go out of business, which you know is not good for the Indian economy, but now provides more workers for the British government, who's simply looking to ex extract more and more resources. With the introduction of hospitals and modern medicine, just like in Africa, we see India's population shoot upwards, which again is great if the country and the economy can support it. But if India's economy begins to fail, and you know, the major jobs are now going to be in resource extraction, um, you know, mining, farming, things like that, that doesn't necessarily improve the quality of life. And so as India is now you know, being controlled by the Europeans, you're seeing a, a bit of a role reversal. You know, whereas before, Europeans had been so desperate to get to places like India and China and were just amazed at their technology and their science and things like that, um, you're now actually seeing the British begin to view Indians as completely inferior. Uh, that India has nothing to offer them other than a place to get the materials that they need to continue their industrial revolution. Now, there's a couple other things that happen um, that, you know, it's a little hard to decide. Was this a good thing? Was this a bad thing? You know, the population growth is one of those. Sometimes that's a good thing if it's beneficial to your country, and sometimes it actually causes problems. Um, another one is that India is now unified under the British Raj, which, if you remember from when we talked about the Mughals, it just hasn't happened often that India is totally unified. It's more often throughout its history been ruled by, you know, individual kingdoms. And it's really just been, you know, the Mauryans, the Guptas, and then the Mughals that were able to turn India into an empire. And so again, while this is definitely a good thing in some ways, you know, unification of a people usually brings with it certain advantages, um, strengthening the economy, things like that. Um, in this case, because it's being done by an outside group, the British, um, you see a lot of the same parts of, you know, the disrespect for culture, uh, and things like that where India's unification is now a little bit hostile. And then finally, India being unified under one language. Again, there's a lot of pro there's a lot of pros that come with that. 
a lot of benefits of taking a country that's been linguistically divided, you know, dozens of languages, hundreds of dialects, you know, to have communication and conversation made easier because now everyone is being forced to use the language of the British. Um, but at the same time, that can be very much a negative because it creates a loss of culture. It creates a, a lack of value for the existing native languages because now all those local people are being told your language doesn't matter. If you want to have anything happen uh, economically, if you want to start a business, if you want an education, if you want to move up in government, you got to learn English. And so to have that enforced on their country certainly carries with it some negatives. So just like we saw with Africa, it's really hard to say imperialism was all bad or imperialism was all good. Uh, there's definitely elements of both. Now, as we finish this segment on India, we're going to transition into the effects of imperialism further east in Asia, specifically on China and Japan. Uh, so this may be a good time to click on some of the video links in this section of the slideshow and get some extra information.